Well, hi everyone and welcome to Designers for Learning's first webinar for our new semester this fall for our Open AB MOOC. Tonight is Thursday, September 15th, 2016. And we've assembled a panelist, a group of panelists that are our facilitators. We actually have 16 facilitators total in the course. And I think we've got, what, uh, uh, six of us or five of us here tonight um, just to say hello. So again, I'm Jennifer Madrill. I'm residing right now in Chicago, Illinois. And Lisa, you want to start us off and say hello? Oops, you're muted. As an SME last. Uh, the last MOOC, and I'm looking forward to working with you this one. Nice to see you again, Lisey. And Ruth, do you want to go ahead? Oh, sure. Hi, I'm Ruth Sugar, and I was a participant in the MOOC um, during the last cohort, and I'm very excited to help out as a volunteer this time. And we have Amanda Duffy. Hi, everyone. I'm Amanda, and I helped um, the development and the facilitation of the MOOC last time, and I'm really excited to be a part of it again. And we have JR, who I think is working on some shaky Wi-Fi, if I'm not mistaken. So JR, are you able to say hi at this point, or you want to say your hello later? Hey, sorry about that. My audio is just kind of dropping out a little bit. Uh, my name is JR Dingwall. I'm in one of the course designers, but also a facilitator, and I currently reside in Edmonton, Canada. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight, and thank you to all the viewers. As you may have heard uh, me mention when we, before we uh, officially started, this is a new interface for us. We were very familiar with Zoom, but we now have the ability to have up to 500 people in a webinar or webcast or whatever they call it. And so the features are a little bit different for all of us, for us as panelists, as well as maybe for you as viewers who are used to working with a Zoom. Um, for one example, everyone comes in muted, and then um, I have the ability to, to promote everybody as we move along, which for obvious reasons uh, is needed, so we don't have a hundred and some people trying to talk all at the same time. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in by um, sharing my screen. I have um, a set of slides, and hopefully, um, if, if some, if those, if those of you can help me out by posting the link to that in the chat room, I'd really appreciate it. I kind of lose my ability to walk and chew gum here once we, once we get going. Um, but um, what I first want to do, I, first of all, can everybody see this? Right? You should nod your head. You can see them, right? Okay. Um, and then just also, please feel free to use the text chat. We've got the other panelists that are trying to keep an eye on the text chat. And, and also, if you raise your hand with questions, we'll, um, we'll certainly do our best to, to address them as they come up. But I do have about uh, 15 or so slides, and we'll go through them rather quickly, um, of what our, our view is of the course and give you a sense of lay of the land of what you can expect over these next 12 weeks. But I really want to start out by just thanking everyone. This is a service learning course, and we really do try to emphasize that through the process. Clearly, we're all here to learn more about instructional design and to network and to get to know each other. But at the heart of what we're doing, we really are here to provide a service to the adult basic education community. And um, we really try to, to have that weave through everything we do in the course. And, and for that, we really thank you for, um, for, for participating with us. And if you're not in presentation view, just uh, thought I'd let you know. Oh, yeah, thank you. That's okay. I, I think it gets weird on my end if I, you mean, this, you can still see the slide though, right? Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, it gets a little wonky for me for some reason when I then blow it up to presentation mode. Um, so as far as our agenda tonight, um, we, I, as you just met the uh, facilitation team, um, but then I'll also share a link with you that will give you um, a little bit of background on all of our team. I'd like to go over some housekeeping items in terms of important dates that should be on your calendar. Um, and also this semester, we've tried to do a better job in finding ways for you to connect with peers. We have a very large class. Uh, right now we're starting out at 1,200, which is actually less than what we started out with last class, and we ended up at over 2,000. So we fully anticipate more people will join us as we're going on, and so that really becomes like a fire hose of information. And we really want to try more um, to do a better job this year of, of keeping it from just being the facilitators um, in, interacting. And, and, and I think, Lisey, we were calling them the SMEs. We were calling them subject matter enthusiasts. And we really want to try to reinforce that idea that we're all experts in some way, shape, or form. And so we've um, incorporated a few things in the course this time that we didn't have last time that will hopefully help, um, help you be able to connect with your peers, both inside Canvas as well as outside. 
Um, and then we uh, will spend a little bit of time going through the course format. Certainly, I don't want to repeat. There's a lot of information in module, uh, module zero of the course. So if you're confused about what this whole experience is about, um, which I don't blame you, it's a big course, lots of people, a lot of moving parts. Um, my best recommendation is to head to module zero and just go through it page by page. And we've tried to make it like a frequently asked questions. So you get a good sense of what the need is, why we're all here, and then also how the course flows uh, once you get into it. And so tonight we'll talk a little bit about the badges, what the design project is, um, the, the tools we're using on OER Commons, and how you can get a sense for what your design project requirements are, which are all part of the design guide. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about our bonus challenge, which is for those of you that are joining us that have been with us on prior cohorts and you've already done the main part of the course, and now you'd like to come back and do an additional bonus challenge, we'll talk about what that's all about. So um, as I mentioned, uh, there are six of us here tonight from the facilitation team, but um, there are many more of us that uh, are part of uh, the project and behind the scenes. So if you click on the link that's here, it'll take you to our webpage at the studio.designersforlearning.org. And you'll see the full roster of our uh, participants on the facilitation team. It's an amazing group of people. Um, we've got a lot of folks that are faculty at various colleges across the globe. Um, for example, Camille Dixon Dean is um, in uh, in Melbourne, and so it, I guess I can't forget our Canadian connection with JR. <laughs> You're our only Canadian on the project. I have to keep pointing that out to poor JR. So as I mentioned, our current enrollment, we're at 1,200 people, which is, I think, pretty amazing. So the reason I bring this up is I personally had never taken a course that had 1,200 people in it. So uh, when before we started tonight, Amanda was commenting on how amazing it is that we've already had several hundred people already post their introductions. So it is going to be a fire hose of information. You will see a lot of information. And so my best recommendation for those of you who are like me that have never done this before, uh, we, before we started doing it at Designers for Learning, just dip your toe in. If it gets overwhelming, step back, and leave the discussion board that you're in that's overwhelming and move on to something else. Uh, find your people, find your kindred spirits. Um, if you use the search features within our discussion boards, you'll be able to drill down to say, for example, maybe the college you went to, the country you reside in, your special interest. So there's lots of different ways to slice and dice this 1,200 people without having it completely feel overwhelming. Um, but I think the cool part of it is, is we are 1,200 people. And so what we bring to the table is pretty amazing um, in, in terms of our backgrounds and experiences. So let's, let's consider it a positive and, and try to minimize the, the, the overwhelming feelings that we all, we all will inevitably get. So in terms of important dates, last time, uh, this is a 12-week course. Um, last time we had people um, that progress slower through the course than we um, and anticipated and we extended the end date. Unfortunately, we can't do that this time. Uh, we're butting up to the end of the semester for a lot of faculty that are on our facilitation team and also the holidays. So that's gonna be a pretty firm date. Um, so you, as you're kind of laying things out in your mind as you're going through the course, do con consider that December 4th date to be a pretty firm date when we're gonna shut things down. And, and again, just because the facilitation team and others, um, and many in the class are teachers and, and they're gonna be having a pretty busy time of it coming up toward the end of the semester. Um, and then we also have three additional live webinars planned and certainly you don't need to attend the live sessions We are recording the session and we will post it on the website But if you are interested in joining live, here's the schedule and then we have um, something kind of cool planned for November 12th It's um, designers for learning as a nonprofit and it's going to be our fall fundraiser and we're going to have a fundraising campaign and on the, the 12th of November we're going to have a 12-hour webcast-a-thon and we've gone out and we've invited um, pretty cool people from all different landscape, parts of the education landscape. And they're going to be joining us one person an hour. And um, it, should, it, it should prove to be a pretty cool day. We're going to be using this interface. It will be in Zoom. So we'll get all the information out later about how you can log on. Uh, but it'll be neat. It, we don't have the schedule fully filled out as far as the number of people. We're about halfway there and getting our 12 speakers confirmed. But we should get that pretty quickly. We should have those, um, those firmed up. As I mentioned, we're working pretty hard this time to enable peer-to-peer -peer connections. So this whole area in our course is new this time. Um, we had a peer-to-peer -peer chat and we did have some special interest groups, but we've set up literally 200 <laughs> project groups, which are just blank right now. They're empty 
And so if you go to the section of the course where it says join or create a project group, if you're interested, it's totally optional. If you're that kind of person, not, it's not me. I don't, I don't voluntarily join for many projects, but uh, with other people, but if that's your cup of tea and that's what you're interested in, you can do it uh, by going to join or create a project group and it will walk you through the instructions on, on how to do that. And here's a, a quick little screenshot. Um, you go to the people side on the left navigation, that will bring up the, what you're seeing in front of you. If you click on the tab that says groups, you'll then see all 200 of our blank project groups. And we have two that are already formed. So you, you can see in the first group, there are about five people uh, participating on that project team. The next one has three. And certainly you, you're free to set up your own if you have, like I can said, colleagues or people from your, your college program or whatever it may be, or you just want to randomly meet up with folks, that's fine. And then basically once you're in the project group, it looks a lot like Canvas. You have the ability within your group to have private discussions just among the folks in your group. There are other collaborative features of, such as sharing files and things like that that you're able to do. So that's kind of a cool feature. If, if, that's your, if that's your thing, if you're not into doing groups, ignore what I just said. It's, a very, it's totally optional. And then we also um, hear from everyone, uh, or many people anyway, I would say the vast majority of people who join our projects that they're very interested in the networking aspect of Designers for Learning. And so we have a group on LinkedIn, Facebook, Google+, which poor Google+, I think Google+, is kind of going by the wayside. Uh, we haven't had a lot of people sign up for that. But, um, and then we certainly have a hashtag that we use on Twitter, OpenABE, which I'm sure you've, you've seen or heard me reference already. Um, and so if you go to, if you're a Twitter person, um, you can either follow us on at Designers for Learning and you'll see all of our updates, or you can follow along with the hashtag OpenABE and then you'll be able to keep up with things, um, updates and announcements that we may have there. Um, we also have Digo. Um, I'm not sure how many people these days are that familiar with Digo, but Digo is a social bookmarking site and it's an option for people who like to, to share uh, resources, so links or whatever it may be. Um, and 100 people are signed up for it, so there's certainly um, some, some people there, but it's not nearly as robust as some of us, our other areas. And I also wanted to put in a plug for links, and maybe I'll just pause for a moment. If um, Amanda and, and Lisi, I'm not sure if you have the ability, would you mind giving us a quick little uh, update about links? Because I think it'd be really, um, really cool for the folks that are in our course to know a little bit about it. You want me to start? Uh, 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 Lynx is a fantastic resource for adult educators, and it has uh, several resources to help people who are administrators, teachers, even students, I mean, researchers, anyone. Um, I work with uh, the 16 communities of practice. Uh, each one deals with a different topic. I do reading and writing and diversity and literacy. There is ELL, there is technology, there, there are discussion groups that invite practitioners to discuss ideas, share resources, come up with innovative ways of uh, finding solutions, etc. There is a uh, learner portal that is designed to for learners, for adult learners, and it has vast resources that some of you might want to use for uh, developing your materials. There's a, a professional development uh, section. There's a learning portal where you can take free uh, self-paced courses. And there is a fantastic resource center that allows you to find articles and research. And uh, it, it's just uh, an amazing collection. And today, uh, yesterday, Amanda and I participated in a, a webinar that introduced people to uh, the free ESL Pro resources. It's a vast volume uh, of content for uh, professional development for ESL uh, teachers, but it, can, it also has resources for learners. So if you join links, and I invite everybody to do so because it's a fantastic resource for adult educators, uh, you register and then it takes a couple of days for them to approve you. And then you can join um, the communities and discuss. And I invite everybody to, to really get in there and discuss issues because through dialogue, we learn. And um, that's kind of an overview. That's very cool. Very cool. Thank you. Did you have any comments, Amanda? 
anything you want to, any plugs you want <laughs> to make? I mean, I, I would just echo everything that Lisi said and then just say that it's really um, a safe place to ask questions because there are people who are brand new teachers and there are people who have been teaching for years and all of them ask the questions, all of them have questions. So it's just a really safe space um, to seek out advice from your peers. Very good. Um, and, and certainly if there are other communities that you belong to, um, that's what our peer to peer connection is, or even the area that we have in the class for resources. If you belong to a community that you think is really cool and we would all benefit from knowing about, please feel free to share that. Um, and to that end, um, I'm going to share a couple things that have just popped up in the last couple days. Um, well, not, this one wasn't last, last couple days. I've known about this one for a little while, but um, this is Kristen Anthony. She's in our course, and she also um, runs a podcast called Dear ID Podcast. And she was very sweet to move the interview she did with me to today. So she, it's a podcast we recorded over the summer, and she posted it today. And it's an amazing, I love her whole approach. Um, she's very open and transparent about her design process as she's working on projects on her um, either volunteer work or things she's working on at work. She has a blog that she maintains. And so you can follow along with what she's doing there. But the interview that she did with me, I was just giving her the lay of the land as far as how Designers for Learning came to be, what our goals are for our projects and things like that. Um, but she has really cool stuff that she puts out. And I just wanted to bring her up as an example of, I'm sure when you go through the introductions, you'll notice that many, many people have portfolios, they have uh, websites that they maintain, blogs they maintain. And so it's great to go poke around and see what people are doing because as we all know, in today's world when you go out to find a job, people are going to ask to see your portfolio. They're going to want to have some idea what you're about, what your educational philosophy is. And as scary as it is to put yourself out there in an online forum or whatever it may be, um, a lot of the ones that have posted in our class have done a bang up job, a great job of, um, of doing that, of, of putting things together. Um, Jennifer raised her hand. Jennifer, you want to put your question in the text chat? Would that be all right? Or maybe you're just playing around with stuff. Maybe you just pushed it by accident because your hand went down. Um, and then the uh, second example I just wanted to highlight, and again, there are so many. We could spend literally hours tonight going through the great examples that were posted in our introductory posts. But last night, um, this is um, Brittany Brown um, O'Donnell, and she is a member of our course, and she's also um, a, a doctoral student at Virginia Tech. And so last night, she did something really cool, or yesterday afternoon, and then I saw it last night. She did a think aloud process of going through our module zero and one, mainly modules, um, module one, where we talk about the learner, the context, and then the needs. And it, it, I posted it here on the bottom where you can, um, you can look at, you can find it both on Twitter as well as on her um, website, the link to that. Um, but it's the, um, her whole process, it was so interesting. It was very raw, it was very rough. But she, it, it, you watched her, you could literally watch her synthesize the design project. And she went through all kind of the, the first steps you go through when you're thinking about what the needs are, what the constraints may be. Um, so do take a peek at her work. She's, she's a real cool person and it'll be real fun to follow her work. And as I said, you know, keep letting us know if you're doing a similar type of thing, you know, post on Twitter or whatever. Just let us know that you're, you're doing something similar too so we can follow along with, with the work you're doing. Um, and now I'm just going to spend a couple minutes because, like I said, Module 0 and Module 1 do a pretty good job of laying out what we're looking for. But um, I just kind of wanted to give you a lay of the land for those of you that maybe haven't had a chance to play around too much in Canvas at this point. It is a project-based course. So the reason you're here is to, at the end of the day, del deliver an open educational resource that will, in, in effect, be a lesson plan with materials for an adult in educator, um, an instructor, to be able to use in their adult education classroom. So the seven modules that we've created take you through that design process. And uh, we also, as I mentioned, have the bonus challenge. So once you get into the guts of the course, there'll certainly be the course content, which you can download as an EPUB file. Um, and then there are practice ex exercises, and they're identified exactly as that, as a design practice exercise. Those are ungraded, and they're not anything that we need to see or you don't need to sub, um, submit. It's just really reflective activities that you can do on your own. And we usually give for each one, I think almost everyone at this point, after you've done it, we give some things you could think about. 
Um, for example, Amanda had a really great resource um, for us that she found this year. It was the Empathy Map, which is in Module 1. It's one of the best ex practice exercises we have in the course, and it's brand new. And that's an example of an ungraded practice exercise to try. Then we have, obviously, the group discussions that I've mentioned already. Um, it's the discussion forums. We also have designer reflections. Those are individual. They only go right to the facilitators. Other people in the class can't see them because we also know there are times you don't want to, you know, you're, you're, you're not interested in doing a think aloud that everybody can see. Um, those are part of the class. And then finally, the design deliverables. There's going to be a design plan you turn in, which is like a, a proposal, a written proposal, and then you're going to be turning in a prototype and then your final deliverable. And so those are toward the end of the course. That's in modules four, five, and seven. And then you'll notice also um, we have due dates that are on the schedule. So if you click on assignments, you'll see the roster of these that I've just described in terms of the reflections and the discussions. Um, however, um, those dates are very squishy. We know some people are burning through the class already. I know we have people already done with module one. And I know some people haven't even enrolled in the class yet. So don't get too freaked out if you're getting too far ahead or you feel you're getting behind. The idea is just to have some schedule out there that would, um, would get people to December 4th. And then as I mentioned, they're the two digital badges, uh, which are here. So once, once you complete, successfully complete the modules one through seven, you'd be eligible for um, instructional design service badge. And once you complete the uh, bonus challenge, you'd be eligible for the um, open content badge. And the cool part of that open content badge, that's actually a co-branded co badge with Canvas. Um, they worked with us to um, put that bonus challenge together. And so that's, that's kind of a neat feature. It's not just from designers for learning. And now I want to um, kind of stop this being a talking head for me and bring in the other uh, facilitators to help me des describe what we're doing here in terms of our design cycle. Um, we aren't using any model that's truly an de instructional design model. I know a lot of folks are very familiar with Addy. Um, if you look at what we're using, you can definitely pull out elements of Addy. Um, but this is a basic design model that is used by architects or engineers or you know, whoever considers themselves a de designer. So our first module of the class that you'll be working on in the next couple weeks, you'll be really doing this whole analysis phase and, and getting into some of the synthesis piece of things. So I really wanted to spend some time now and really get the input of our facilitators to help me out on this. We're going to be, as I said, analyzing the course and the project requirements, um, as well as then the need. So why is instructional support needed for adult basic ed educators? And um, who are our learners? And we've put together these personas that you'll see in module one. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, and what, how, you, how you can use those. And also the learning context. These are um, all things on this page. Uh, it sounds pretty straightforward, all laid out here on this bullet pointed list. Um, and I'll, I'll certainly again ask the panelists here, the facilitators to help me explain why it is really hard to get your head around these points. Most of us in this class have not been students in adult basic education course uh, classrooms. Certainly have some uh, in the class who've been volunteers and who work in this field. And so a lot of times when we talk about adult learners, our minds go to graduate students for some reason or professional development that you may have in a work setting and that's not our learner population so with that i'm going to be quiet and i'm going to ask um, our panelists uh, amanda uh, or ruth or, or lisa at least you've worked in the field um, many many years to give us a sense tell us what it's like to tell us what an adult basic education classroom looks like and what the types of learners um, may be Well, I usually don't mind getting started. Uh, in adult education, especially in federally funded programs, um, the population is 17 and over. And uh, in community programs or in libraries or uh, uh, programs that don't receive funding from the feds, uh, that can vary. But generally speaking, it's 17 year old and above and uh, the populations vary considerably. All ages, uh, all needs, all, uh, there can be occupational, personal needs, although the federally funded programs these days emphasize workplace education. Um, and there's a lot in, in uh, this uh, MOOC that will describe what that means and how to contextualize or, or keep the learner interested by approaching uh, academic 
ag education like reading, writing, math, and all of that within the context of their interest. Um, I always read WIPPA, and I call it with Pia. And I know Jennifer. Uh, what what did you pronounce it as? Uh, some, something not not like that. <laughs> I was wrong. I was never wrong for the longest time. That uh, is sound instructional design, and it takes uh, students through an introduction to the material, which grabs their interest, where you attempt to, uh, I call it hook them, because you're hooked in what you're interested in. If you're not interested in it, uh, you're lost, they drop. And then it takes them through the warm up where they get involved in talking about what they know and then they, they come through the actual practice and application evaluation and so forth. So the, that model works very well um, as long as you consider the basic principle that adults learn to the extent that they recognize that what you're teaching them relates to what they need or they want. Basically, uh, the design is, is uh, applicable to anything. And I know that anybody who completes this course will be able to use it in a variety of ways. Just to uh, add a, a, a hook to you, what I perceive as being not addressed as much as it could be in uh, the field that you're now going to be dealing with, adult ed, um, there's very little out there on the internet or elsewhere for low level readers and low level English speakers. There's lots of stuff for people who can read at K through eight and above uh, at uh, eighth grade level or above, but there's very little for low level readers that's fun, engaging, interesting, and related to needs. So if I can put out a hook to you, I hope that some of you will address that. Jennifer, you're on mute. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm I was trying to, yeah. Oh. I'm sorry about that, Ruth. Do you want to go ahead, Ruth, and uh, and describe what your, your perspective um, sure. is? Yeah, I guess um, something to think about with adult uh, basic education is that it's not as um, prescribed uh, curriculum as a lot of, as K through 12 is, for example. And so, um, while there are standards, which uh, everyone in this course is going to be introduced to, um, teachers have a lot of flexibility in terms of what they present to students. So that's something that's different. Um, and also, as uh, Lucy mentioned, the context is different. And so a lot of what you're going to be providing is supposed to be a lot more um, uh, applicable to real life, real world, um, needs that adults have. So whether it's some, something for their work environment, for their job, for uh, family life, for civic participation, things like that. So those are some things that kind of differ for within an adult ed classroom than what maybe you're familiar with in a K-12 environment. And Amanda, do you want to take a shot? Yeah, I would just add a couple of things. Um, one thing is location. So um, adult ed programs vary in terms of their funding and their, their space availability. So um, some classes are held with little to no technology. Some classrooms have an abundance of technology. So that's something to consider um, as you're designing. Um, to kind of piggyback off of what Ruth and Lisi mentioned is this idea of real world and it needs to be applicable um, and I think it might be helpful to think about it in terms of the adult learners time um, oftentimes our students come to us and they're working one or two jobs they have families and they're taking classes um, so what's happening in the classroom needs to be immediately applicable and they need to see that it is immediately um, able to be used in, in their in their real life yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And that comes up right away. I know a lot of people, because we're taking an online course on Canvas, everyone assumes that we're designing online learning. And I hope you caught on to what um, Amanda said. Uh, a lot of the ones, uh, the classrooms that we're targeting, um, the teachers that we're trying to support 
um, do not have the ability to have their students go online. And so right off the bat, our online learning would not assist them and help them. Now that's not to say, as Amanda said, that's not to say that's how every classroom is and probably as time moves on, more classrooms will move to more online or blended learning. Um, but I know that is kind of a stumbling block for a lot of people when they join. Uh, for some reason, we just assume that we're designing online instruction and, um, and that's not the case. So, um, and then Penny, I see you're here. I'm sorry, I missed you earlier. Do you have the ability to use your, um, your audio? Did you wanna give your perspective? Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Go okay. ahead. <laughs> now, hello, everyone from California. I'm Penny Pearson out at um, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. And so we get to work with a lot of adult education teachers. And it's so nice to hear the call for um, more open education resources that can be designed specifically for our adult learners. One thing I would encourage, and, and um, okay, and Jennifer, pop in here if I'm speaking out of turn, is we're seeing more and more learners here in California that are turning to their mobile devices. Mm. So as we go through that design process, it'd be nice to see um, some of those things be a consideration for that only. Um, and I think that uh, in looking at all that's been spoken of before, what Lisa said, what Amanda and what Ruth had talked about, Keeping all of that in mind it can make for some amazing products, I'm sure. So um, I know that this is going to be a, a really great experience. I'm looking forward to working with all of you in one form or another. You bring up an excellent point. And um, I, I think I posted either in the Digo group or somewhere about Cell Ed, uh, which gets yes. to your point. And they, uh, they've got some very, in, from a design standpoint, it's very simple. Their, their philosophy, they... It's, they're micro lessons and they're sent out as text messages. And so it's using like kind of the lowest um, uh, functionality affordances on a cell phone. It's not a smartphone, but the stuff they're doing is pretty cool. So it's called Cell Ed. And you can just Google it. It's, it's exactly as it sounds um, and, and see what they're doing. But that's a really great point. And then to talk a little bit about um, how people within the class, if that's something you're interested in, we do have a special interest group set up in, again, that peer to peer connection area for um, what, what I'm calling out of the norm strategies. So as we said, kind of the normal classroom experience may be face-to-face, -face, but certainly as everyone on the, has already mentioned, we're, we're certainly seeing that things fork off and as technology improves and becomes more affordable and, and more accessible, um, well, I'm sure we'll see things um, eventually fork off into different directions. So, so definitely keep that in mind. Um, Jennifer, can I say just one more thing? Sure, yeah. Um, so, well, actually, two more things. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> the first thing is, um, as you're as you're planning um, the the course product, keep in mind that adult learners come from a variety of backgrounds, and they're adults. They have a ton of experience, a ton of life experience that you can build off of, and it's really important to make those connections to the students' lives. The second thing being um, many of the students come to us having not succeeded in a traditional classroom. So if, like most of us, you tend to teach like you were taught, just try to be aware of that, that a lot of these kind of traditional four-room, you know, four-wall classrooms um, did not necessarily work well for our students. So it's, it's a great opportunity to be creative in what you're trying to deliver to the students. And you know, um, I mentioned earlier Brittany's uh, Think Aloud that she did, and I really do, and I think I saw, um, I think Jason is in the chat helping us try to find where that is, her Think Aloud. Um, she mentioned in her Think Aloud, she's dyslexic, and you know, she's a PhD student, and so she was really hammering on this idea of um, accessibility and that, um, you know, students, a certain amount of students are going to have learning disabilities and so trying to keep those types of things also being aware of that so I just thought that was a really cool part of her think aloud is she shared that publicly so I'm not telling a secret <laughs> she uh, she shared that um, but I think those are really interesting things for us to as a group um, talk about and think about ways that we can make accommodations and um, uh, where they're necessary so like I said take a take a peek at Brittany's thing as well JR I know you and I are like <laughs> We don't have a lot to contribute to this part of the conversation, but did you have anything uh, you wanted to mention? I, I think just based on what's popped up in the conversation around the mobile devices is that um, Christopher Simpson mentioned in the chat that uh, in his setting that 
um, students don't have access to technology outside of when they're actually in the classroom with their instructor. And so I, I think it's just really important for your projects as you go through to consider who your learner is and, and design based on the learner, but also recognize that um, you won't necessarily have technology. And in the field of instructional design, it's very easy to jump on right away and say, yeah, I'm gonna have all of this technology and do computer assisted instruction. And that's not necessarily going to fit the context. Um, and so that's, that's a lot of what I've learned as, as we came in uh, to this project as well. See, I think those are cool. Like, I think uh, if you talk to uh, most instructional designers who've been doing this a while, these things that we consider constraints are actually kind of cool to think through and, and figure out ways. And as Amanda's posted in the text chat, you know, universal design for learning, it's really what it boils down to is, you know, how can we make our product the most accessible to as many people. Um, and let's, um, let's spend a couple seconds now talking about, um, oh, actually, before we start talking about the, uh, the project, this is a special favor. Um, we have so many adult educators, as we just heard from those that are on our panel and our subject matter expert team, uh, but we have so many that are in the classroom. And so I threw together and truly threw together in about five minutes a Google survey um, it's going to be, your responses will be uh, anonymous, but what I'd like to do is to be able to share with the class your responses uh, regarding the context, the learner, the needs, and any advice you may have. Um, and again, all with this idea of helping those of us, including myself and JR and some of the others that have design backgrounds, but not for adult education, to continuously get a better understanding for um, what we are, uh, what our requirements are and what we need to be able to do. So now getting into more of the devil of the details here as far as the, the design project, um, we are using one common platform, um, and this gets to be kind of confusing, and I still don't have a great way to describe what this is all about, but um, OER Commons is an open educational resource repository. And they also have a feature called Open Author, which allows you to create it basically looks like a Google Doc. So if you're familiar with Google Docs, that's basically what you're creating. It's a blank shell when you open it up. And so when you go in, you're going to be using um, something called that we're calling the design guide. And so that our design guide has three parts. It's got, uh, the first part is you're going to be describing what your lesson is. The second part is you're going to be designing your lesson, which means, as, we, um, as Lisi mentioned before, the WAPIA framework. And all this is laid out in a lot of detail in modules. I'm kind of cutting to the chase here so you have an idea of what the end game is. Um, and then the third part is um, simply where you cite your, uh, your resources and your references. Um, so what you're really going to spend most of your time in this class is in that part two where you're designing your lesson. And really try to get your head around the fact that you're designing a learning experience. So think about it that you're, there's a, an adult educator, an instructor that's working either one-to-one, -one, probably more likely in a small group with adult learners, and you're thinking through, okay, how is that instructor going to introduce the lesson? How are, they going, how are they going to present material? What type of practice activities are they going to have? And then not only what that sequence will look like, but what are the resources that they're going to need? So if, you're, if they need to, uh, if the learners are going to have some type of reading material, you need to find that reading material. And if you can't find it, you need to then write some type of passage that, that they'll be using. If it's a worksheet, you need to make that worksheet. Um, and this came up, I think Ruth actually brought it up over the summer when we were talking about um, thinking about how things went in the prior class. Um, that kind of fell apart a little bit last year on some of the designs where it became more of an outline for the instructor but didn't have the guts of the lesson, didn't have those handouts, didn't have the lesson materials, didn't have the assessments, didn't have rubrics um, that might be needed. So that's really, most of the time in this semester you're going to be spending your time working on that part two is actually designing the lesson and what that instructor will be doing with his or her learners. Um, and so if you really want to get into details, which we're really jumping ahead now, if you go to the design guide, it's in the course on the right, I'm sorry, on the left hand of every page, it says design guide. You click on that, it will take you to this Google Doc. And as you can see, when you go in there, the, it's colorful to see who else is in the, um, in, the, in the document at the same time. That will lay out what the specific project requirements are. And it's probably not a bad idea to go through and read that. A lot of it won't make sense right now until you go through all those modules but at least it gives you an idea of what your end game is. And I think, Lisa, you mentioned that in the, um, one of the discussion forums this week. She considers that kind of whole, part of the whole backward design process, 
where you think about like, what do I need to do and what do my learners need to be able to do? You're kind of thinking of that end game and then you start to kind of backfill and, um, and create those experiences. Um, the activities and the readings and things uh, will follow from that if you kind of have, have a pretty clear idea of what your goal posts are. Um, and so um, probably another good thing to do um, is to take a peek at our group that we have in OER Commons. We had about 40 resources that were completed during last, um, last session. So if you click on the link that it's at the bottom of this page, it's um, the Adult Learning Zone on OER Commons. Um, Ruth has a, a resource, or I think maybe even two resources in there, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Janet Lee, who's in our course now as a facilitator, has. Um, Susan Jones, who's on our um, chat tonight, she has a, a resource that she put together. And so it'll give you a sense, and, and you'll, you'll be able to tell, we have a, a wide variety of people in our class, from novices to Susan and Ruth and, um, and Janet are all adult educators, so they come at this experience with a very different take and a different focus. And you'll be able to see that when you go through the artifacts that the students created in our prior class. And I think that will be um, um, kind of an eye-opening thing for you if you really are very uh, uncertain right now about what we're doing and have questions about what your project is that you're working on. If you spend a little time poking around and seeing what the prior group did, um, you know, I think that will be, will be helpful for you. And with, with that said, I would like to also throw up a vote to the group. We have a little poll going here in the group. Let's see where it's at. Right now, I, uh, if, you go, if you click on the, I don't know, if, I know some people have different interfaces, so I'm not sure what you're able to see. But I, I threw up a poll earlier tonight about how many resources we think we're going to complete as a class. And we have some very ambitious goals in that, right? I'm looking on the, the screen and it looks like about 38% think we'll have over 200 resources. So, you know, from, from, from your lips to God's ears, I, you know, that, that, would be, uh, that would be great. So either to, you know, cast your vote either in the poll or if you want to hop over to this other Google form that I created. I think it would just be kind of fun if as a group we, we thought about what is our end game and what is our goal in terms of the number of resources and lessons that we want to be able to design this class. Um, so with that, it, oh, I do have one more thing and then I promise I will be quiet for the next uh, remaining time. We'll let everybody, everybody who has a question jump in. Um, I did want to spend two seconds talking about the bonus challenge. This really is for everyone who's already completed modules one through seven and turned in a deliverable in OER Commons. That's really needed for you to get all the stuff we talked about tonight to really get your head around all that. After you've done that and you wanna take on the bonus challenge of then converting your lesson to online learning, uh, where you would then incorporate such things as discussion boards and other things like that, that's all part of the bonus challenge. And Susan Jones is hanging out down in the bonus challenge and I think, uh, uh, let's hear. Janet Lee is in uh, working on that, and I think a couple other folks that finished some of the modules last semester um, are, are already tackling the material in there. So that will be a fun little area to watch as well. And so with that, now I will be quiet. I promise. So if people want to start raising their hands, and I'll start promoting people. If you have your audio available, if you want to start um, jumping in and uh, being promoted to a panelist, so you can ask questions. So do we have any, any takers? Or if you want to just continue to ask your questions in the text chat, that's great too. And also, a, a panelist, is there anything I met, missed as far as, gosh, I can't believe she didn't say that because it's so important. Anything else you want me to mention? I didn't think, oh my gosh, she didn't say it. But, <laughs> I, but I, as uh, you, as we review what was produced last time, it's important to notice that uh, some plans have a better quality than others and that we don't edit content uh, we suggest we provide examples we support but essentially we don't uh, uh, keep anybody from posting a lesson that they're going to use so as you review the resources be aware that uh, some have higher quality than others and you're going to be the best judge as you go along and understand what the design is. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And um, you'll see in module six, we have an evaluation module. And so you'll have the ability to peer review other people in the class. And um, we also then have the facilitators step in and offer some guidance. And as, as Lisey said, we don't dictate, we just make recommendations. And so the idea being, these are all open educational resources with Creative Commons licenses. So maybe there's some glimmers of, you know, little rough di or diamonds in the rough. You know, if you look at it, you're like, eh, I could do better. I could, 
I could work on that. I should have actually mentioned that. And Amanda, this is something you definitely wanted me to mention and I failed to do. If you want to take one of the existing resources that was created in a prior class and you think you can take it to the next level, it's open educational resources, it's Creative Commons, that's the deal. You can copy that into a new uh, open author document and, and take it and, and, and run with it. That's, a, that's an option as well. Um, and so that's the whole idea that behind what we're doing to, to Lucy's point. Any comments on that, Amanda, as far as like, because that's really your hot button. You want to make sure people know that they can, um, can do that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just, it's, that's the beauty of OER. So some people, if you've not had the experience of, of teaching or designing lesson plans for adult learners, you can go to the site and you can um, take a look at some of the resources and then say, how can I do this better? How can I make this a more meaningful unit for the adult learners and, and start there? So I think that's really exciting. And you can also combine them with other stuff that you find online that is, of course, open. Um, yeah. There's some great questions coming in as well. Um, and I think Lisa, you might vote, and others certainly. Um, but the question that Reed asked as far as um, having low level uh, readings for low level readers, any suggestions on where to go find some of the um, open resources where they could, could find that material? Uh, what I can do is, and I don't have it right here, but I can share uh, sites that allow you to take your content and paste it into the web and it'll give you the the reading level that it matches. Um, Amanda might know more about how to find those specific uh, resources or maybe Penny, I don't know, or others of you. But uh, uh, just to add to what's been said about using other people's material, it's open, uh, but it, look at the license because attribution sometimes is important. So if you use someone else's work, provide attribution to them for uh, providing sor the source for your materials. And then uh, Chantelle asked a great question that I think um, certainly Amanda and, and maybe Penny and others can, um, can answer. Who will be using our content? I know that's certainly part of your job, right, Amanda, is to get people to use OER. So you want to give us a sense of who the instructors will be, will be using our content? Well, I mean, I think the instructors are going to be anyone who um, I think primarily is on links. Um, or is a connection of anyone who's facilitating or a part of this course um, or someone who is also familiar with OER Commons who goes in and then searches for adult education. Um, but, you know, we share them on, on links and we certainly try to incorporate them into our projects at AIR. So um, it, it really could be anyone. And we, we made a, um, when we were designing the course, we evaluated a lot of OER repositories and we um, zeroed in on OER Commons because it really is the repository best known by adult educators, arguably. Um, some of the other repositories may be more K-12 focused or even for higher ed. And so they seem to be um, of the ones that are, were available at the time and I think still stands um, most likely for adult learner or adult educators to, to be able to stumble on and find. And then Alex is asking about um, getting a sense of our students. I'm not sure how far in the course you are yet, Alex, but um, in the first module, we have personas. And I don't know, who haven't we called on for a while? Ruth or JR or somebody, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about what the, the nature of the personas are? Sure, I, I can say That'd something. Or something. <laughs> okay, um, well, the personas are very helpful because they give you basically a profile of um, what actual adult education students are facing in their lives. So um, I think there are maybe six or so of the personas and um, each one is different and uh, it provides you details of, you know, what's happening in their work life, personal life, their education backgrounds, things that they've faced, um, what their goals are, um, areas that they're having challenges with, um, what their skill sets are. So you can use all that information um, to figure out, well, what would they be interested in learning about? What's something that they really need to learn about? Um, what are their strengths? So I want to play to their strengths. I can, you know, weave in things that they're actually really going to respond to in a lesson um, and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, it makes it very helpful to have that. It really gives you a sense of um, what does this particular learner need. Um, the way I 
did mine when I was a participant. I, I thought of it more as a group activity, but I believe we have, um, and Jennifer, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you can um, definitely do it more geared towards that individual learner that's in the persona, but you can also think of it as a group of people with those common traits. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. So we, 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 it's exactly as you said, we've shared, I believe it's six different personas. It could be a person who's incarcerated. It could be you know, all different storylines um, that are, are contemplated. But maybe you're an adult educator or you volunteered in an uh, adult basic education and you're, you're thinking of somebody. The whole idea is to, to um, get your head around, rather than just designing for uh, like a generic person, <laughs> it's almost like when you're writing. They usually said, that's what I remember when I checked some of my first writing courses. They said, when you're having a hard time writing, think about your audience. Think of one person rather than thinking of a whole bunch of people. Just pick one person and, and, and write your narrative to that person. And that's kind of the same idea of uh, what we're doing with the personas is certainly we're not saying that you, your lesson will only be able to be used by Jeff in a rural setting, <laughs> um, you know, who has trouble with whatever we've laid out for him. The idea being more as you're designing it, if you're thinking of him in mind, you're more likely to have an empathetic uh, approach to what you're doing and you may um, have a, a better uh, appreciation for what his pain points may be, what his feelings may be, um, and, and what his life struggles have been and what his goals are. And so that's really the idea why, of why we, we've used the personas. So yeah, great, great example. Um, I, and then, I think you really lock onto something that's important there because like lots of times in product design or visual communication design, it's like, I want to create a product that can be used by these 18 different groups. And so you end up with a product that doesn't really do anything. And so instead, the approach here is to really think about that one learner and how you can tailor the lesson to get them to their goal. And to Amanda's point is that if one already exists for Jeff um, in that learner set, how would that lesson be different if it was for one of the other six personas? How does the context change? So then does the delivery of that lesson change or do the examples that make it a real life situation change? Um, those, those kinds of things. Um, I also just want to quickly mention that uh, Elizabeth had a question about the uh, availability of the course materials after December 4th. Yeah, they'll be available. Are, you mean the can I, I'm assuming you're meaning the uh, Canvas Network course, our course. Those it will be indefinitely. The only thing that shuts down is the uh, discussion posts, and I think that's just more of a privacy issue. They're really only available for those that are enrolled in the class, and so unfortunately, it's. The way the world is we those just do not linger forever um but the content of the course will be as long as canvas is in business and continues to host the course they'll, they'll be there forever um and then i did want to pick up on a couple points that alex was making unfortunately we have not done this long enough to know how our resources are be, being used at this point by individuals we have no idea if they've been downloaded or any of that information at this point because we just completed them so but we do have an evaluate i'll put a plug in for this we are offering an evaluation course in the spring of 2017 it'll start in march and run through may and that's going to start that ball rolling we're going to do some deep deep peer review of the modules that have been created with the idea that we're going to start pilot testing them with adult centers down the road. I'm not saying that's going to happen next spring, but that's definitely part of our end game with what we're doing here is that this is the design course. There's going to be an evaluation course. And we're going to take that evaluation out to the field and, and test them with real learners. Um, we have so many questions. Let's see. How, <laughs> let's see how many we can get through. And a lot of them are great comments. I, I'll definitely save the text chat so we can go back through. A lot of people are sharing some good resources um, as well. Let's see, any questions I'm missing, JR, or anybody who's keeping up better than I am here? I think I missed one. I know I missed one. Uh, we have the reading level. Um, oh, okay, uh, LaDonna had, LaDon had, LaDon had a question regarding um, if we have any idea of how many GED takers are studying in either a group or classroom setting versus how many are studying alone. Any thoughts on that, ladies? No offense, JR, but I don't think you know the answer. Can you repeat, Doug? The, uh, yeah, the question was in a GED classroom. Does that tend to be um, an individual working alone with study materials uh, and maybe with the help of a tutor, or would it, would it be more likely that it would be in a, a small group or a classroom setting? 
Well, as we've uh, discussed, the settings for adult learners is just, it, it varies immensely. Uh, so it could be a tutored situation. Uh, there are a lot of materials that teachers give uh, to the students that they can do on their own, Khan Academy and so, so forth. Uh, so it, it, it's, it really depends on the financing for the, if the, if the program can finance a teacher or not, or if it's just promoting tutoring and uh, from volunteers, it's, it's, it varies greatly. And just to put in a quick note, the first client we worked with was Grace Centers of Hope, and they very much took a, an individual working alone with the help of a tutor. So they had kind of their own plan to get them to be able to pass the GED, and they worked on the materials individually. So that was just one, as, as Lisey said, that was one example, but that was definitely the, the one that they wanted us to focus on when we worked with Grace Centers of Hope. Um, I also wanted to mention, and I think I think this was, I can't remember if it was Ruth. No, it wasn't Ruth. It was definitely not Ruth. Um, <laughs> another student in the, in, the, in the prior class had found a great set of resources, but they weren't open educational resources. And she wrote off to um, the person, the author, and asked if they would mind licensing their work with a Creative Commons license so she'd be able to use it for her project. And they said yes. So even if you, you know, run into a brick wall where it looks like it's copyrighted material, a lot of times if you Right, contact the person and explain your need, um, you, you'll be able to, to get them to uh, amend their license and make it open li openly licensed. So in, in a lot of the projects that we've worked on, that's happened quite a bit, and I think Sue has actually done that. Um, so I encourage you all to do that because oftentimes they don't actually know what open educational resources are and they're happy to make their resources available um, for people to use and modify. Okay, well, I think we are, oh, what is the GED? We, that, bad, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's very bad of a, a GE is what? I, I'm not even gonna try it, because I know I'll mess it up. So what does the GED stand for? It's like general education, general education development. Say it again, Ruth. Oh, general education development. Yeah, general education development test. And it's, it's covered in module two, and I'm sorry, module zero and one. There are actually now multiple um, paths to high school equivalency, a couple different other tests, but we kind of generically just still lump everything under the GED. Um, okay, well, we have two minutes left, and I think we've hit all of our questions. And unless I'm missing one, you can post it in the bottom. Did I miss one, anybody? And I don't see any hands raised. Monique uh, just asked. There's something that just popped up in the Q&A. Oh, okay. Um, the cutoff. Actually, you know what, Monique, we don't. It's maybe a problem. <laughs> but we turned off the uh, enrollment date. I believe it's deep into November. So because some people, you know, they have the time. And so we, we considered about a 40-hour project. And so if someone wants to join in, in November and, and spend the month of November just, you know, pounding through it, it they certainly would have the time to do it. So. Long-winded answer to your question, it's November. Oh, and there's questions in the Q&A, which I have not done a great job. Oh, great, okay, so um, let's see. Reed was asking if there's a way to propose project group types to the larger group. If you go to the peer-to-peer -peer text chat, um, I don't know if you guys have answered these, and I apologize if you already have, um, but that's no, a great question. Reed's has not been answered yet. Um, so Reed, if you go to the peer-to-peer -peer chat um, and you can propose your idea, then that's probably what the best way to then get people to, to branch off and then start joining a project group. Um, and, I'm, and I think we answered Elizabeth's, yeah. So even though the course ends uh, December 4th, that's in terms of the facilitator support and your ability to turn in deliverables to get a badge. The course materials will definitely be available after that. Um, da, 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 da. Our discussion forums, are they are not publicly searchable um, online. Um, that's just a core, uh, Canvas feature. I'm sure it has to do with like FERPA or whatever that is. I'm sure <laughs> there's something behind it, but no, nobody can see that. The question was, can people read our discussion forums outside of the class? Yeah. The, uh, the other note that I just put on there is 
it's all, although it's it won't appear in like a, a Google search that anyone can still register for the course and then have access to those. So. Yep, that's a great point. Okay, well, we hit the one hour. Uh, um, we're all like, what is it, Cinderella? Or what is it? Was it Cinderella that hit midnight? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Don't remember what it is. But anyway, I'm trying to say we're done. <laughs> so thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. As I mentioned, the recording will be posted. So if you joined us later, head early, um, you can catch the rest of the recording. And we'll see you later in the course. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you guys. Thank you, Jennifer. Bye. You guys are awesome.